The ghost Marowak blocking the top floor of Pokemon Tower is iconic, but it often leads to people maybe wondering why Marowak just wasn't a ghost type from the start. Today we'll be taking a look at Alolan Marowak and like with the Executor, this is not only one of my favorite regional variants, but it's one of my favorite Pokemon period. This is an example of the design just being knocked out of the park and the Fire Dancer themed bone along with the ghost typing as a throwback to Pokemon Tower, it deserves a chef's kiss. The front sprite for this run, it was made by Pat Ackerman. Now you can find one of his socials in the description. And if you want to know the rules for the run, they're found there too. There's also a link to an unlisted video where I go more in depth with about my runs and the setup if you need that. And if you like solo run content and you have a spare second, whether you are someone new, maybe someone who just doesn't think about that sort of thing, or if you are a returning subscriber like Nick Price, hit that like button and tell me how you think the run's gonna go. This one definitely has an uphill battle compared to some of the other videos in recent weeks. And we'll get back into that, but for now, let's just hop into it, and that means it's time to sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop, and let's see how this run goes. Today, Blastoise is the obvious choice for the rival starter, and there's going to be a handful of things that's going to define this run, and we can just kind of run through those real quick. We haven't talked about the base stats yet, but they are shared between both of the Marowak variants. The key difference here is that I use the highest special stat for my runs, so while Gen 1 Marowak only has 50 special, this one has 80 because its special defense got a little buff starting in Gen 2. The main antagonist of this run is going to be that 45 base speed. It's just not that great, and it's going to struggle to outspeed in several areas of the game. We'll also be going back to that Gen 8 learn set today and it seems like we do that a lot. Sword and Shield just seems to really know how to put together a learn set and there are some key things here we'll come back to as the video progresses but the main thing to cover here is the four starting moves. We got Double Edge, we got Headbutt, we got Tail Whip. We're familiar with that but Shadow Bone is the first new move of the run. It has 85 base power along with 10 power points and 100% accuracy. There is a percentage chance to lower the target speed defense normally but I didn't bother to code that in so it's just the no effect move here. This is essentially going to be the saving grace of the run. Now obviously it's a ghost type and it's ghost typing is going to give us that valuable same type attack bonus and since ghost is a physical type in gen 1 it's going to do a lot of work on this run. We're going to be put on the back of shadow bone and as for the TMs I never show the TMs anymore for later gens because there's about 800 of them and we'll go into more detail about some of the special moves this thing can learn but all you really need to know is things like earthquake, swords dance, rock Rock slide, body slam, you know the usual culprits for a physical learn set. As for the early game, you can tell that this is not going to be a repeat of Alolan Raichu or Ninetales by the fact that I'm going to be battling all of the optional bug catchers here in Viridian. Notice how Shadow Bone does decent damage, but it's already not enough to get one shots in this early game, and that's why we need to actually do these extra battles. There's not much to the early game outside of that. I'm at level 8 when I leave the forest, and that takes us straight to Brock. The Rock Solid Pokemon Trainer has high defense on his Pokemon, and while we could just brute force our way through the fight, the more strategic way to save power points for the next route to avoid healing is to utilize Tail Whip. Since this is red version of Brock, his Geodude has Defense Curl, and you can see that it does take quite a few times to get the Tail Whip defense drops to actually stick, but after some back and forth, I start to do some solid damage, but I do get a little bit unlucky, the ranges don't go my way, and it does take an extra turn rather than just taking two like I wanted it to. On the Onyx, this one doesn't have a way to boost its defense, so I can easily just set up all the Tail Whips I want. It makes it a little bit faster, and just like Geodude, this one also barely survives, takes another extra turn. Now while the rest of this battle plays out, I would just like to reiterate how good the ghost topping is in Gen 1, especially in the early game. For example, Brock, he can't even he can't even damage my Pokemon outside of Bod. And Alola Marowak's topping here is gonna be one of its strengths in the run, but we can move on. Looking ahead, 45 base speed forces our hand to extra training, but first, the next move arrives at level 12. It's Flame Wheel. It's kind of like the Bubble Beam of fire type moves. It kind of lies between Ember and Flamethrower. The stab fire damage along with the 25 PP, it definitely helps us stay out in the field longer. And as for optional battles, I do take on this optional bug catcher here. Flame Wheel allows this one to be very quick and simple, and now we can look ahead at Mount Moon. There, I do battle the ever so familiar super nerd, and then I go to the bug 
Bug Catcher directly after him. I also take on the Double Grass Lass, and then I wait for a level 10 or 11 Zubat because I need just a little bit of extra experience here. I also take on the Hiker. Now, even though Fire is weak to Rock and Ground, it resists Fire as well. Their defense is really high, but they actually don't have any Rock moves to go against us, and they have very weak specials, so it's actually a pretty quick and efficient battle to go ahead and take this on, even though you would think that it shouldn't be the case, but it is. And all of that, it's enough to push me over to level 18 when I wrap up Mount Moon, and while this doesn't make things really easy looking ahead, it's about the best you can do with that careful balance between getting extra levels and actually having a good in-game time. When we reach Cerulean and we get ready for rival number two, the red flag here is that we don't outspeed Pidgeotto's 33 speed. Even if I did something absolutely crazy like use two rare candies here, I still wouldn't outspeed it. So today we're kind of going back to a YOLO strategy and a reset, it wasn't outside of the realm of possibilities. Since normal tops are immune to ghost, two double edges will be the fastest path to victory. And as much as I would like to say I avoided the bad sand attack luck, I do actually get hit with one here. But being positive is something that I'm striving to do more of this year, so I'm not too worried. And here I would like to say that just like the Skeledurge run, I fixed the original game's coding to allow ghosts to actually be super effective against psychic types like you see on the Abra here. Otherwise, I personally feel like there'd be no point in even taking the time for a cross-gen ghost type run, considering that psychic is really the only thing they're super effective against. But we'll come back to that. And before we go on that tangent, let me just say that the rest of the battle goes pretty decent. I do miss because some of the accuracy drops, and even though I do get crit by the Squirtle, I get a little bit low, I do still come out on top. But like I said earlier, a reset here, it really wouldn't have surprised me. And to actually get past this one on the first try, it's a victory in my book, I'll take it. Now the misses and the low health, they do prompt me to actually have to go heal. It's not really ideal, but it is better than wasting my limited potions and dipping into maybe an elixir later. But let's go back to that tangent. I got a couple of things I want to say, and let's segue into that. Let's go back to Shadow Bomb being super effective against Abra. Obviously in vanilla red and blue, it just wouldn't affect Abra at all. So I took the liberty to fix that line of code so ghost Pokemon can be effective in their designed role and new Pokemon like this can actually shine. There was a very small minority of people that didn't like the change and I kind of want to address that real quick. Now I'm going to keep this short. I just want to say that I personally feel that it makes sense to correct the original coding mistake. Now when you're using your own personal free time to create code and troubleshoot a functional new Pokemon at a Gen 1, I just really don't want to be held back by a 26 year old coding bug that completely nerfs ghost Pokemon. The original code is not really that big of a deal in Gen 1 since there's only the ghastly line and the only actual damaging ghost move is the pathetic 20 base power lick. But in this series, I'll keep it real with you guys. I want to see ghost Pokemon at their full power. I want to see Shadow Ball. I want to see Shadow Bone just fulfill their purpose of doing so super effective damage on things like Alakazam. And whether you agree or not, and I'm sure most of you do, that's basically kind of the long and the short of it. The second thing I want to talk about is burnout. Generally, you hear that phrase and you would think it means, hey, I'm tired of playing the same game over and over, or maybe I'm making a backlog of videos and that's causing me to feel this way, but that's not really the case. What it mainly comes down to, there's a couple of things, but it's channel performance. Now, they're always, in life in general, there's going to be ups and downs, but recent dips has caused my faith in the direction of content to be shaken a little bit. Now, I'm always transparent, and since I am making a backlog, the audio from this is going to be around the time the Muck video came out and the new Zelda game was releasing so what I'm saying now might not even be relevant to when this comes out in July but I do like to speak my mind. Without going on and on about it recent videos like Diggersby and Obstagoon they just haven't performed well and a bad performing video can make subsequent videos do worse and it's kind of this vicious little cycle that happens from time to time and I had to make an emergency pivot here. By the time this comes out I had already done things like make the Rattata video make the Feraligator video and I wedged them between my original plan which is to do a full Alolan Summer event but I just didn't want to have those videos do really bad and just have the channel suffer even more. Now things like a Lolan Raichu or a Lolan Nantes, they could have done very well, but I can't really tell the future and I did what I had to do, what I thought was necessary based on the data I had. I think in general it's kind of human nature to want to see progression and growth and the things that you cultivate and nurture. And I'm sure most of you can relate to feeling stuck and for me, things started to feel a little stagnant and I felt like I just didn't have the answers, but we'll see how it plays out. But I just wanted to keep this as short as possible 
people. And if you're kind of pissed off that I talked about some personal feelings for a minute, uh, get over yourself, buddy. Overall, I am in positive spirits and I think we're going to get over this hump eventually. But speaking of spirits, I think it's about time we get back to the video and let's just take a look at Misty. Star U is up first, and unfortunately our low base speed means that we're going to take some super effective damage here. Now on paper it doesn't look like a whole lot, but we do get chipped down for about a quarter of our health before we take it out in one hit and move on to the real problem. And the silver lining here is that Starmie is a psychic type, which means Shadow Bone is going to blow a hole in it, but you know it outspeeds, and our real loose condition here is a Bubble Beam crit. It does go for Bubble Beam, and we survive in the red health. And I would like to say that Shadow Bone is not a 100% guaranteed one shot here, but we do hit the range, we knock it out, and anytime a fire Pokemon can get past Misty without having to go down to the SSN or do a bunch of extra grinding, it usually bodes pretty well for the run, so I'm happy with the result. Next up, I'm going to talk about Dig for a second. I talk about this sometimes, but it bears repeating. I'm not going to learn it here, and you might be wondering why, because after all, it is kind of TM28 and everything, and I always talk about Tombstoner. But I don't think Dig's great. It's a pretty good move if it's all Pokemon can learn, but we have some really solid choices already, and we just simply don't need it. Now, the main reason we don't need it, if we look into the next battle with the Triple Pidgey last here, is that at level 24, we get our next new move, and it's called Stomping Tantrum. You might be wondering why it's spelt a lot shorter on the screen that's because there's character limitations in gen 1 so you got to work with what you got but stomping tantrum is a 75 base power ground move and it's just better than dig in every possible way now think about it this way dig is a two turn move it effectively means that you're doing 50 damage a turn so the 75 base power of stomping tantrum well you get it i don't need to explain simple math to you guys stomping tantrum just better now i think we can take it all the way down to the ssn not really all the way because we're already here at the last anyway but body slam is up next. It needs no praises. It's going to be great in situations for something like Pidgeotto, Pidgeot that are immune to ghost moves and immune to ground moves, so it's really helpful here. I also pick up the Gentleman Candy. No need to go into that, and I think we can go straight into rival number two. And I guess I'll talk about why rival number three and four are always so weak. Now, we talked about the 33 speed from Pidgeotto and rival number two and how I would never be able to outspeed it unless I just took a, a ungodly amount of time, but here, notice that it only has two more speed. It has 35 speed Speed, which means now we outspeed and now that we have all these upgraded moves needless to say we, we just crush this one there's no need to really talk about it anymore and since we have stomping tantrum now there's really no reason to talk about surge either even though we might get outsped and we aren't a ground type which means we can get hit with thunderbolt unlike the regular marowak it doesn't matter because we just make short work of this one and that's two key battles down there's no reason to linger on this let's keep the video going there's no real need to take a look at rock tunnel normally we skip it but just so I can cover all my bases here and answer any questions before they come up. I will say that Alolan Marowak can actually learn Thunderbolt, but I'm not going to use it. And here's a big reason why just starting up right here in Rock Tunnel. Ignore the Cubone, who cares about him, but you'll notice in this clip we do have Shadow Bone, and normally Thunderbolt would be very helpful at knocking out the pretty tanky Slowpokes here, making things faster. But with Shadow Bone doing super effective damage against Psychic types, there's just no real reason to really have it just yet. And there's another big reason for this as well, but we'll talk about that down the road. Uh, if you look on the sidebar at the TMs, you probably know why I'm not going for special moves. Now let's pick it back up into Celadon, and I think you guys know what the first stop of choice usually is. We're going to the Rocket Hideout. We're doing the usual things. We're playing a couple of slot machines. We're picking up the high money items. As for Giovanni number one, he does have defensively bulky Pokemon, and I can't one-shot him, so it's a little bit slower, but it's not bad. I'm in no issue of having to reset here, but I would like to go on a quick tangent here. I often get asked about the Pokey Da Marowak skip. Like, why don't I use it? Why doesn't every channel use the exact same rules? First of all, pretty stupid question. And second of all, we're going to get to a video where this makes more sense here, but notice how this is kind of slow. Imagine if you were playing a Pokemon that only had, like, resisted moves for Onyx. If you guys remember the Voltorb video, Giovanni was a huge struggle. Imagine if we were allowed just to skip past Giovanni. I just don't think you would get to see the full game. I think some Pokemon struggle in certain areas. I don't like skipping stuff. That's really the long and short of it. Tangent over. Let's move it on. And that can take us straight into our one Celadon Mart buy. There's not much to say here. 
I do pick up some top floor TMs. I'm going to sell one of them. I need just a little bit of extra money. Overall, I can afford one protein and four carbos. You might be wondering why not more carbos. But this combined with the training combined with the three free wins that you pick up throughout the game means that I will max out my stat experience as far as vitamins go. Another key thing for this run and one of the reasons you have to kind of rush this buy maybe a little bit faster than I would in some other runs is rock slide. Now I've talked about how we're doing an all physical learn set and since we're not using things like thunder bolt rock slide is very valuable coverage it's going to make some battles a lot easier that maybe you wouldn't even think were hard in the first place and i guess i should address why i'm not going straight to erica here even though a lot of her pokemon moves like rap and stuff like that are not even effective as a ghost i resist all the grass stuff you figure it'd be a great matchup here to get some more money but i'm going to be real with you guys the fight wasn't that great and i was kind of scared of it so i held off and now we're just going to go to pokemon tower I want to talk about this fight today because I had to use Rock Slide for this. You might be wondering, why would you get rid of Stomping Tantrum so soon? And Stomping Tantrum's kind of already done its job. We really need this for the Pidgeotto because this Pokemon's not too fast. It's not really a game-changing Pokemon this early in the game. So if you take Sand Attacks, it makes the run feel rather inconsistent. It feels much better if you just have that heavy Rock Slide super effective damage and you take it down in one hit. Now overall, the rest of the battle's just rival number four. There's no need to talk about it. We also have Shadow Bone for the Ghastlies. And we wrap this one up quickly. Let's just move to the next segment. Now, it's actually going to be time for Erica. We've done Pokemon Tower. We got some extra levels. We're level 35 for that damage rounding threshold. And we're taking the shortest route here. No extra training. And it's always good to see this execute get absolutely blasted by a move and get one shot because I hate it. Now, we can take a look at Erica. And let me reiterate that I really wasn't scared of resetting in this fight. I was scared of this fight just taking a lot of time. I was worried about maybe like a turn one sleep powder. Maybe wasting like six, seven, eight turns or something like that. I would like to call out the absolute buff foonery of rap working against ghost types notice that it doesn't do damage that part works correctly but i still don't get to take a turn it's very annoying i don't know why this exists it's gen 1 i'm not even surprised anymore but i do make it through this and it looks pretty good because flame wheel's doing all right damage i make it through the very pathetic tangle with ease and then my worst fears come true where i didn't think they would the bile plume actually puts me to sleep and even though this thing can do resisted damage it's starting to get me really low and i'm wasting a lot of turns being asleep and this is exactly why i didn't want to come here and although i do take the battle it ends up just taking more time and that's why i held off on it i probably should have just done this one earlier but this was my third marowak run and we're not going to redo it but that's erica down and pretty soon we're going to start transitioning towards that late game. After taking a trip down to the Safari Zone to pick up the very valuable vitamins and the final HMs of the run, it's time for Silphco. And you guys know the drill by now. The 10th floor has so many goodies. We've had the luxury, maybe one of the only times we'll ever see a Pokemon skip it on the last couple of runs. But today, I actually really need to come here. Stomping Tantrum was pretty good, but what we're all here for, what we know is the one of the best physical moves in the game. One of the best moves in the game, period, is Earthquake. But I don't learn it yet because I'm trying to be really efficient with my item management and whatnot here so we'll skip ahead just a little bit now i'm going to show you guys a little something behind the scenes here and this is personally why i prefer in game time to a real life metric since this is just a hobby i make a huge blunder here i'm going to go up and i'm going to get the swords dance tm we'll talk about that in a second but i accidentally i learned it fine but when i learn earthquake i accidentally override shadow bone now if you were doing a real life time run and you're being like a real stickler for the rules this run would be absolutely destroyed and you would have no choice but to restart the entire run just because you're dead set on having real life time as the metric either that or you have a significantly worse run overall and I just hate that now I do make use of save states from time to time just in case I make a big blunder and just like this you'll see me instantly save state back to the Arbok grunt and redo this process again overall I don't have time to play like 16 of these runs if I make one small mistake and just have it absolutely derail the run and have to start over i hate that that's just why i use in-game time that's why i don't personally like real life time kind of a side tangent but overall what i'm trying to say here is this marks your hard pivot into something that we've seen before swords dance earthquake rock slide it's become a little cliche at this point especially for these cross-gen runs and stay tuned to the end of the video i want to talk about my thoughts on 
on everything becoming a little bit repetitive with these cross-gen runs, but it is what it is. The main difference here is that instead of Body Slam, we'll have Shadow Bone for our third option here. It's a really good learn set, no doubt about that, but let's stop blabbing. It's straight into rival number five. From this point on, it's a hard pivot into figuring out how many Swords Dance you need, and it's going to take Marowak to a greater height than it could ever reach without a boosting move like this. Now for Pidgeot, we do need one Swords Dance, then a Rock Slide is going to be the answer here, obviously, and we take it out and we move on. We do take some Wing Attack damage first, though. Now as for the Growlithe and the Execute, the Execute can sometimes be a little bit of an annoyance here, and we don't need to set up anymore, but we just have great answers for both of these Pokemon. They're not evolved yet, so we do outspeed them. So it's not much of an issue we can move on now I want to talk about something else and this is like the biggest difference between a dark type run and a ghost type run it's the fact that psychic is neutral to ghost and they can actually hit back obviously Alakazam's gonna outspeed me it does hit me pretty hard and you know I'm gonna hit back and one shot it because it's physically frail anyway but I am getting kind of low that's the thing to take note of when we're going into the blast toys the number one problem here like it's gonna happen a lot in the runs is that we're not gonna outspeed this little tanky turtle thankfully it doesn't have great water moves but a turn one withdrawal does put our shadow bone damage into a pretty much a three shot range whereas it would be a two shot range before and you may not think this is too much of an issue but even though it has weak moves we start getting a little low we start getting lower and lower and then I still get down to 23 health and I'm like uh oh should I be worried right now and the answer is yes because it goes for a bubble I'm thinking that this is going to be the end but I survive at just two HP we fire off that last shadow bone and we seal the deal we take the victory. Marowak limping but still alive. That's zero resets. Rival number five down. And I often talk about this how going to Sylph, especially on a slower Pokemon before you take on Koga to get like the speed badge boost, it's a risky play, but it is a faster play, I think. You do save a little bit of time by going to Sylph first, and ultimately the goal is to see how far you can push these Pokemon. And this battle was really tough. Just like I talked about with Rival number two, this was another part of the game I thought I could reset at several times, but to get pass it on the first time it just feels really good it kind of justifies your routing process and you do see this in the footage right here I picked up that hyper potion right before rival number five and it always comes in clutch it's one of my favorite items in the entire game shout out to hyper potion Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in any of my videos, believe it or not, Sabrina has an intro. And why she has an intro? Well, turn one. You can just see that the Kadabra instantly crits me, takes me really low, but let's just shrug it off, move on to the next Pokemon. Now here, I do need at least plus two attack to take care of the Venomoth, and I know that Mr. Mime's rather weak itself. So I set up here, and I do set up an extra time just because I'm thinking maybe the extra damage can help me. I'm not sure how, but we take it out, we move on. And the annoying thing here is that I uh, the Venomoth actually outspeeds me and it knows a psychic move so we take even more damage and by the time we're going into the end of the fight I'm down to just 31 HP looking down the Alakazam and I pretty much gotta hope that it uses a useless move maybe gets a one damage side wave or something like that but it doesn't it goes for the side beam it takes me out and we have our first reset of the run in attempt number two history repeats itself I get crit turn one I go down pretty low before I take it out now the goal is the same here set up on the Mr. Mime because it's weaker but Mr. Mom decides it's had enough it's gonna attack it hits me with the confusion I go all the way down to just 2 HP and I'm still gonna give it the old fighting chance here but like we seen last time I don't outspeed the Venomoth and it's out for blood today too and I actually get knocked out by a Venomoth for the second reset of the run so that's pretty cool on the third attempt the game finally decides that it's not gonna mess with me anymore so Kadabra doesn't crit on turn one that means I'm much more healthy going into the Mr. Mom the Mr. Mom luckily decides not to attack this time either so I'm able to get my setup the way I need it to I'm able to take it out now for the Venomoth guys Venomoth was on one today it decided it did not want me to pass this fight so it actually goes a uh, side beam crit takes me down pretty low and at this point I was worried I was like am I gonna have a third reset here did I route this wrong but on the Alakazam as we can see it goes for side wave side wave very laughable move it does five hole damage the way damn side wave is a uh, unique move I talked about this on a stream while 
while ago. It's a it's a neat move in like the conceptual sense, but the way it was implemented is absolute garbage. But that's it. We passed the battle. We do have a couple of resets here, but what can you do? We're really slow. They hit really hard. Let's take our badge and run. And now we're taking it down to Fuchsia. We're gearing up to fight Koga. With Earthquake, you know this is not going to be too bad. I'm going to shove this juggler. We're going to absolutely destroy him, but I just want to talk about what I kind of foreshadowed earlier about Ghost not really being that dominant over Psychic types. Now in Gen 1, all, the only Ghost types were Poison types, so Psychic actually dominated them. And you can see that we can hit hard enough just to demolish them, but the low speed on Marowak, you can really see it shine through right here at this portion of the game. And the smarter, more consistent way to route would be to probably do Koga first, because you'll get that speed badge boost, and you can use Sword Stance to up your speed even more, and you probably wouldn't even have to worry about things like the Mr. Mime or the Venomoth or something like that. I'm aware of that, I know that, but we're going for the fastest time. There's always that blend of consistency versus speed, and we're always trying to find balance it, but it's interesting to look at, and let's just talk about Koga, and there's not going to be much to talk about here. We got Earthquake. I do take the time to set up just a single Sword Stance because it does put everything into a one-shot range, and after going through some pretty tough battles, it feels good to have an easy win. And now we're kind of cruising. We got two more badges left to go. And now, my friends, that takes us to a very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. There's nothing extra today. And with a video filled with what I feel like is so many tangents, let's go on another one. How about that? And I would like to just quickly mention Alola Marowak's move pool. Now, you guys know on the sidebar, I don't list every single move from the TM Learn set and stuff like that because this is just what I found to be relevant. It's easier to digest, easier to look at. Now, this thing can learn like Ice Beam, Blizzard, Thunderbolt. It can learn a, a lot of special moves. But it being a physically weighted Pokemon and the fact that it learns Swords Dance made me go away from that. And I just wanted to address it because people talked about me not using Ice Beam or something like that in the original Marowak video. And I really want to just, just get up front and talk about it now before anybody does. Swords Dance makes the special moves obsolete. And I would like to talk about something else I've been working on. It's hard to fathom that I could keep improving, but my item management isn't good. There's a reason why I have the bag number on the screen. If you didn't know, in Gen 1, you can only hold 20 items in your bag total. So I'm always looking for that. And there's little bitty time saves, like if your bag's full when you talk to a gym leader at the end, the text is quicker because your bags are full and they can't give you the item. So I'm always looking to kind of exploit little things like that. And notice here, you'll notice in the footage that I do pick up the blizzard tm i'm not gonna use it and it's because at the very end the secret key is the last item i actually have to pick up in the run that's gonna be new it fills up my back slots and that means for blaine and giovanni i can skip a little bit of text potentially save a little bit of time and that's just one of those tiny little details little optimizations i've been working on i wanted to mention it real quick and from there there's really only one thing left to do i think it's time just to sit down and get into a meditative state and really ask yourself if the 20 28th TM of the game is Tombstoner, brother. Or if it's actually Dig, who knows? Are they one and the same? Do we have like an Elden Ring situation where Radigan is Merica? Because we may never know. But that takes us straight to Blaine. And if you watch how I struggled against Sabrina and Koga was that easy, and now you're about to watch Blaine be really easy, you might be wondering, hey, why didn't you do Koga, then do Blaine, and then come back to Sabrina? And the answer to that, I already kind of answered it, was that it's actually a little faster. You might have to give up some resets, but it's actually faster to do still first. Anyway, that's Blaine down. It looks like there's only one gym left, guys. And you know what the story's gonna be here. I do have to set up one Swords Dance just to hit the ranges on the tankier Pokemon. And I'm not gonna set up any more than that, even though I still can't one-shot the Rhydon, but overall, it's a very safe fight. Pretty much zero chance of me losing. And what I think's hilarious when I'm playing these cross-gen runs right now is that now we can just say that, hey, Alola Ninetales have, has, it's already beat the game at this point. And that's kind of crazy to me. I did some streams recently, like we're going back months. I was doing streams and I couldn't tell you guys that I got a, an hour hour 48 time because I didn't want to spoil anything but man it's a really fast run guys I don't think we're ever going to be beating it and I guess it tells you everything you need to know about Giovanni the fact that we're not talking actually about his battle so let's just keep it going straight into rival number six and this one's fairly simple especially now that we got all the badge boost we're a little bit faster all that good stuff the key here is going to be setting up one sword stance taking out that Pidgeot now in practice I did notice that this thing could crit a lot and start taking you down kind of low but it doesn't really matter it doesn't here we 
can move on. We don't level up yet, but we're about to, so just go ahead and take out the Rhydon. We can move on to the Growlithe since we just leveled up to 46. It's time to set up, and you don't have to set up here, but keep in mind that the Blastoise does have Hydro Pump, and we've had problems on the Alakazam previously, so the end of this fight is not really a joke. It's kind of, you know, can be difficult. So set up just a little bit extra, play it a little bit safe going into these tougher Pokemon. And the extra setup does pay off because the Alakazam just goes for a Reflect, which doesn't do any damage, but it does make it incredibly tanky. Pretty much halves my attack, but the extra setup means I do more than enough damage just to absolutely wallop it. And as for the Blastoise, plus four on your attack doesn't guarantee the one shot. And here I get a little unlucky. I don't quite one shot it, but thankfully it does not go for that Hydro Pump. If you didn't know, Withdrawal is a water move. So it just kind of picks them at random. It goes for Withdrawal. I avoid like a critical hit Hydro Pump or something devastating. I get out of here with a victory. And now we're looking ahead at the final battles of the game. When I was thinking about the Elite Four, obviously something comes to mind really quick. When you're a fire type, there's only one huge enemy that always sticks out, and it's Lance's Gyarados. So I was kind of wondering how we're going to deal with that. But this is the optimized run. We have practiced it a lot. And I guess the only other thing to point out on the way there is that I do skip the Victory Road Rare Candy when I can, and it doesn't help that much. I always want to save a little bit of time. And here, it just, the simple fact of the matter is that it didn't make a whole lot of difference. I do have 10 Rare Candies. I use eight of them to get up to level 55 and without further ado I think it's time for the elite four We can keep this first battle short. There's no need to draw this out and act like something amazing is going to happen. We do want to set up Swords Dance, and even if we got the absolute worst luck and we got some Growls or maybe some attack drops on the Aurora Beam, I can just keep setting up Swords Dance to offset that. And the magic number here today is plus four. And at that point, on most of the Pokemon, you can just go straight Shadow Bomb because it is more accurate than Rock Slide. And at the end of the day, we take it out. And that plus four, what it's really for is for that... Why am I saying that so much? Anyway, it's for Cloyster. Rock Slide does super effective damage, and it's pretty much the only way you're going to one-shot it unless you want to waste some more turns setting up, and I don't. And from there, we got Shadow Bone. It's super effective on Slowbro and the Jinx. I do mess up on the Slowbro and go for Earthquake, so I don't one-shot it, but it's no harm, no foul. It wastes just a very small amount of time, and the rest of this is all one-shots. It's really about the Cloyster, and I don't know why I said four so many times right there. Let's move on so you, we can just forget about it. Nobody will mention this in the comments. Bruno is up next, and... God, I've already talked about being a little burnt out and stuff like that, so it's Bruno. Let's save a little bit of editing time. We can just kind of squish this battle down. I do set up one sword stance just to get the range on the Onyx. The first one does use an X to fin, so ends up not even really mattering, but after, it doesn't matter. It's Bruno. Very easy. I don't even, half his Pokemon couldn't even really do that much damage to me. Somebody go down below and comment, wow, Bruno really surprised me this uh, run, so people will go all the way to this point in the video, so I get that precious retention time. Agatha is up next. We all know she has some weird AI. She not quite juggler AI, but she does have a pretty decent chance to switch. And you're always worried about the hypnosis and just general stall tactics. This one can be a bit of a pain, but here I get a little bit lucky. I set up one swords dance. That's all I need, by the way. And instead of going for something annoying or doing a little bit more damage to me, she makes a hard swap into the gold bat. And that means that I can pretty much just get out of this battle pretty unscathed for a while. And even though I don't outspeed things like the haunter, all I really take going up into the end is maybe a little bit of nightshade damage and at the very end I guess I do get a little bit low when I take a level 60 nightshade from this uh, final Gengar here but overall it was pretty clean obviously in this battle you have your choice between shadow bone or earthquake both would do the job but there's nothing spectacular about this fight nothing too exciting let's take it on we got a Gyarados waiting for us After the battle, I use my final two rare candies, hit level 60, pretty pivotal. And it's worth noting that just like with the Incineroar video, we get a chance to learn our final move, Flare Blitz, but I don't because we're a physical attacker and there's simply no, there's no room for it on the learn set. I promise you guys one day, we're gonna get a video with Flare Blitz to fully showcase its its power, but not today. I love Flare Blitz and the fact that I put it into the move set means that I really wanted to learn it, but once you're sitting down optimizing, it just didn't pan out. Gyarados is up first, and people who've watched the video before know what I probably want to do. Turn one, set up Swords Dance, tank a Hydro Pump, then take it out. Now here, Lance, he's just not having any of it. Turn one, Hydro Pump crit. I think you know how this one ends. That's our third reset of the run, my friends. On the next attempt, 
here's how it's supposed to go. I set up a sword stance, I tank the move, and we kind of go on the sweep a little bit here. But you can see that Alola Marowak, not really the best at tanking a Hydro Pump to the face. We don't have the best special. We go all the way down to 41 HP, and you might think that this could be an uphill battle, but let's talk about why it's not. Now, the rest of Lance's team really can't hurt you. That's what's funny about it. Now, Dragon Rage, if the AI decides to do it, would be bad, but we do have 41 HP, which means we would survive. And when you're thinking about stuff like Aerodactyl, maybe that's going to be a problem. The answer is no, because the Aerodactyl just can't hurt you because it only knows normal moves. The same kind of goes for Dragonite as well. Even though it kind of stalls a little bit, gets a Hyper Potion, Lance, pretty free. The only thing that can really take you out here from all my practice is a turn one Hydro Pump crit. And you know it's me playing. You guys see me on stream doing stuff. I always get the worst luck. So obviously that was going to happen. But I guess we're only down to one battle left and I think we should take a look at that now. Pidgeot is up first, and normally in my runs with Sword Stance, you might expect me to say something like, Marowak had to fully set up and unleash its full power, but that's not the case today. I did enough damage with just plus two, and I, the speed really wasn't there, so I couldn't outspeed things if I really wanted to. It would just waste too much time. So keep it simple, plus two, take it out with a rock slide, and move on. Alakazam could crit me like it's been doing the whole run, but it doesn't here. And you already know, with a probably without the boost, uh, one Shadow Bone will take it out. So that's over with. We can go to the Rhydon. And I make a slight mistake here. I go for the Earthquake. What I'm supposed to do is set up an extra Sword Stance. So I don't one-shot it. I have to waste an extra turn, but like I've, I've said a million times, it's not that big of a deal to waste a single turn to me. And my friends, the key to this fight was getting to that plus four. This means the rest of the fight is going to be a complete one-shot route. The Arcanine can't send up to me. We do have Shadow Bomb for the very tanky Executor. And even though we've seen Blastoise survive countless hits this run already, we finally have his number one single shadow bone one little pop right to the dome and that's it that's the run over and that's it alola marowak has done it with a final time of two hours 11 minutes and five seconds it's a pretty good run obviously you know looking at last week's run and looking at some of the other runs it's not the best but not every run can be the best what's funny about this one is it's exactly tied with tinkaton's time the main difference being that tinkaton finished with zero resets and didn't really struggle whereas this one you know had a few resets but it is what it is fire type not the best in kanto so as we give alola marowak its card and rank it on the t your list. I think this one is one of the more obvious placements I've ever seen for any of my videos. Since it tied with Tinkaton but has more resets, obviously it's going to go just after that. And I had fun with this one because it really wasn't that great of a run. I think if you were a worse router, a worse player, these, these runs, the time would look similar to something like an A tier or like an A plus tier run, but it felt pretty good not to have this extremely dominant run on the table like Ninetales, but this run is still dominant. And keep in mind that even though I'm saying this run was worse, it would still be like a top two or three run if we were just talking about the vanilla tier list. So it is what it is. You know that the power creep comes in and these runs are just so much better. Learn sets are much better. It is, we already know. Like I said earlier, this is one of my favorite Pokemon. So I had a, a blast doing it as always special shout out to my channel members. I really do appreciate you guys. Anybody sticking around giving me, I know I know you guys are great and you're going to give me encouraging words in the comments, but keep in mind that I'm being positive and that's the whole message here. Positivity. We're going to be good. Everything's going to be good. Videos are going to continue to come out, so don't worry about me, but I think that's about it for me. We're going to go back to like, I don't know if we're going to do Crystal or something like that next week, but we'll figure it out. I'm sure I'll announce it. That's really all I got for you. I got my work cut out for me because I swear my audio file for this one's like an hour long. I messed up so many times. I have to outtake so much audio, but that's just part of the process. I enjoy it. I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.